Hi, this is your instructor, Teresa Pelkey. Welcome to our class. Welcome to our next class. In this class, we will look at additional methods that jQuery gives us in order to dynamically make changes on the web page. We have learned that methods can set and get or retrieve values. So here we again will visit the ATTR method and we are setting an HTML attribute and a value. So in our A element we are setting the target attribute to the value of new and I can see that is actually happening when I look at the rendered code in Fiverr. We also looked at how these methods can retrieve values. So here I have the ATTR method retrieving the value of the href attribute. And I am storing that in an alert, in a variable, and I'm using an alert here to display the value. We also looked at how we can set multiple attributes and values with this different syntax. And in this chapter, we look at this syntax as being called a map. And the same syntax where we have our name and value pairs that are comma separated inside the curly braces, the same syntax is used for setting multiple CSS attributes, properties, and values. Something new that we're learning this week is that many of these methods can also take a function. And these functions work generally with some kind of an index value. And by index value, we think of an array starting at the index value of 1. And where this is helpful is sometimes we need to dynamically generate something in a collection of elements and we want them to all be different. And one easy way of doing that is giving them a different number somewhere in an attribute value or in some other aspect of the code. So here's an example. And if you look at the um, HTML here, we have three A elements. And what we're doing is we are dynamically generating new titles for every all of them. And each title will be different. We will have jQuery resource 1, resource 2, resource 3. So here we have our ATTR method. And we are going to set values for the title attribute. We're going to set the title attribute. But rather than setting the same value, we will be setting different values based on what is returned by this function. All right, we have also looked at the add class method. And here again, we use this method to add a, a CSS class. So here we have add class color red. And if we were to look at the generated code, we would indeed see that that has been done in the uh, Firebug rendered code. The add class method can also take a function. Here again, it allows us to return a value. And that value can be the class name, and we can append some kind of a numeric value to it. So if you look at the right-hand side here, this is my CSS. I have three different properties, color 1, color 2, color 3. And if I wanted to dynamically generate a new class for each of my three LIs, I could do that using jQuery. And this is what it would look like in the web page. We also looked at the remove class attribute. Uh, remove class method allows us to remove 
a CSS class, and this is what it would look like in the rendered code. We also have the ability to remove a class based on the value returned by this function. And here again, if we wanted to remove all of those classes that we just set, they're all individual, class color 1, color 2, color 3, we could do that with the new class. We also looked at the toggle class method that allows us to toggle a class on and off, meaning to add and remove that class. Here again, that would have to come as a result of some kind of an event, such as clicking a button. And this is what, what it would look like when we added that class. And this is what it would look like when we removed the class. We also have the ability to call a function with the toggle class method. But here again, it will, it will add and remove that value returned by the function. And here again, this function works with generating some kind of unique names based on an index value. Some new methods, append and prepend. These are very similar to the HTML method. If you recall, the HTML method is used to write to the page, but it will replace the existing content inside that selector. Where the append method difference differs, it will add the new content to the end of the existing content. It will not replace it, but rather append the content or add it to the end. Prepend does the same thing, except that it adds the new content to the beginning of the existing content. So these are some additional ways, some additional methods that we have to write to the page. And here again, technically we are manipulating the DOM. All right, so let's take a look at the append method. I'm going to append this string to the h1 element. And here we can not only see it in the web page, but we can also go into the rendered code to verify the HTML has indeed been created. Now, the append method can also take a function. And here again, this function works with an index value so that we can append something a little bit different to each selector based on the index value. Here's an example of the prepend method and we are prepending this string to the H1 selector. And here we see the output in the web page and we can verify that, that HTML is indeed being created by looking at it in the rendered HTML view in Firebug. The prepend method also allows us to return a function. So we can prepend the content to the selectors differently with respect to the um, index value being used in this function. The append to method and the prepend to. These are different than append and prepend in that they take a selector as a parameter. So we use that selector in which to place the content. So append to would work at the beginning, the end, and prepend to would work at the Again. So let's take a look. Here is a pend to, and it requires a selector. So we have this content here is being appended to the selector. And indeed, we can verify that by looking at the rendered code in Firebug, and we can see that it is appended to the H1 at the end. The prepend to method here again requires a selector as a parameter, and this is the string that we are prepending. 
to this to our selector and here again we can verify that that indeed has happened and it has been pre-pended at the beginning. We also have the before and after methods. Similar to append and prepend, the before method allows us to add some new content before the selection, the selector, not inside it, not to it, before it. The after method allows us to add some content after the selector. So let's take a look. Here we have our selector, dot before. So I am placing this new content before the selector. So if here's my H1 selector and I look in the browser, you can see that that has been added, so to speak, before the selector. The before method also can take a function. And here again, uh, it works with an index value. So we have the ability to um, add content before the selectors that is different based on the index value. The after method allows us to place some content after the selector. So here's our H1 selector, and if you look at our web page, here we see that that, that bit information is added below our selector. The after method also can take a function, which uses an index value, so that we can place that content after the se each selector um, differently with respect to the index value. We also have insert before and insert after. And similar to prepend to and append to, they take a selector as a parameter. And here again, all of these methods are in some way, shape, or form allowing us to write to the page in a different context. So here we have some content. Insert before H1, so we're going to insert it before the selector, and we can indeed see that there it is. And notice that this method, along with the prepend to and append to, do not work with functions. So we have insert, insert before and insert after, which essentially does the same thing, but only below the selector the existing selector. A couple other methods that we have to manipulate content, the remove method. The remove method is similar to delete. It will remove the selected element and anything that is inside it. The detach method is similar to cutting and pasting. It will remove it, but it will also keep a copy of that selected element in the event that you may want to reuse it at some point in the future. The clone method allows us to, is, which is similar to copy and paste, it will clone or copy a selector. Here again, we might want to do something with that, such as replicate it somewhere else. So here's an example. We have our selector, and we're cloning it. And now we're appending it to the body. So if this was our HTML, our H1 and H2, and we're cloning the H1, it would be appended to the body, so it would actually be on the top, appended underneath whatever content was already there. The wrap method, a very interesting and useful method allows us to wrap HTML, an HTML element, around a selector. And obviously, if we wanted to put some attributes inside that element, we can do so too. So if we had two paragraphs as a selector, and we wanted to wrap this div around them, it would enclose the paragraph with this background 
div containing the background color. So it wraps around each P, each selector. Wrap inner, on the other hand, allows us to wrap an HTML element inside the selector. So it goes inside the HTML element. So here, if we look, if we wrapped an I around H1, we would see in the HTML web page that it is italicized. But to verify that that actually did go in the inside, we will use our um, Firebug and view the rendered code. Wrap all. Wrap all allows us to wrap the element around every, the, all of the selectors, not each individual one, the grouping. So if we had two paragraphs next to each other, it would wrap this div with the background color of yellow around both P's. There would only be one div, and it would wrap around both of them, as opposed to wrap will wrap around each individual selector. A couple other useful methods. We've already looked at empty, and here again it removes child nodes and all the content from the elements. Remove removes the selected element, the selector. Detach. It removes it, but it keeps a copy. And unwrap. Very interesting. Unwrap will remove the parent of the selected elements. So I do have examples in the sample code for everything that we have looked at. So you can look at the code, play around with it to get a better example, to get a better understanding of how these methods are used. Here again, it may not be quite may not be obvious as to where you might use these methods, but they are used. And I also have a video on the table of contents application in this chapter which shows you how we do productively use some of these methods.